hoping to have them done for tomorrow. Um, so we are going to be having lab tomorrow, and we're going to be doing the section of the rat. And there's also the um, option of going and viewing the cadaver. So the cadaver um, has not been completely opened up. Um, so what you'll see um, is the skin and the muscles and the tissues and probably bones. Like I think they've opened up the knee completely. And they've also opened up the skull, the cranium, and they've removed the brain. But they haven't opened up the, um, like we won't be able to see the heart and the digestive system yet. So you want to think about just whether or not that is something that you would like to participate in. So just deciding whether you want to go see the cadaver um, as part of option for tomorrow. Okay. So um, we are starting a completely new section in the course where we're going to be primarily investigating vertebrate anatomy and humans in particular. So when we talk about um, animal organization, um, we're talking about um, the different levels, um, starting with cells, tissues, organs, systems, okay, and then the organism. Today, we're going to um, deal with tissues, and then we're going to move on to the digestive system. So um, we're also going to look a little bit about how the body, animal body, is able to maintain a constant internal environment. So we're going to talk a little bit about homeostasis as well. So when we look at tissues, tissues are groups of cells with a common structure and function. Generally, these cells are held, held together also. So if you think about a cell, cells have or bathed, all the cells are bathed in fluid surrounding the cells because that's how they're able to get oxygen and then get rid of CO2 is through the diffusion of O2 and CO2 out. But when we talk about these cells, they're also connected to one another. So there's like proteins that are connecting the cells and um, so that they, you know, are a, a tight, Tissues can be very strong structures. Like so for when we exam example, think of the skin, the cells um, are bathed in fluid, but they're connected to one another, okay? So when we talk about tissues in vertebrate um, anatomy, we um, study what is called histology. So histology is the study of tissues. So you can take whole classes in histology, and you can look at healthy tissues versus unhealthy tissues, for example. Um, when we look at uh, the types of tissues, so we have categories. And the first category are the epithelial tissues. So epithelial tissue is the type of tissue that lines the inside of your organs. So for example, the lining of your trachea or the lining of your stomach or the lining of your bladder, all of that would be epithelial tissue and is also the outside covering of the body, so the skin. So we can say the outer skin, which is called the epidermis, is epithelial. And this also lines organs. Okay, so maybe it's the internal lining, maybe I'll write internal lining of organs, that'd be better. Internal lining of organs. Okay. The epithelial tissue, um, are, how, are you going to use it all day? Are you using it all day? Um, I was going to use it like maybe in a half an hour. Okay. So the epithelial tissue also um, gives rise to glands. Okay. 
So when we look at the glands, we have unicellular glands, which means that they are composed of only one cell. And these would include goblet cells. And what goblet cells do is they produce mucus. So, for example, the cells lining your stomach produce a mucus membrane that prevents the digestion of the stomach by your hydrochloric acid that you produce. Okay, so those goblet cells are important. The mucus can be protective. It could also be, for example, to cap capture debris. So, like we have um, in our respiratory system, we produce mucus in order to capture the debris so it actually doesn't get down into. Um, the lower parts of our lungs, okay? Then we have multicellular glands. So these are glands that are made up of more than one type of cell. And there are two types. The first type is called an exocrine gland. Exocrine means that it produces its substance and it secretes it via ducts. So it secretes its substance, whatever it is, could be milk, it could be sweat, via ducts. So a good example of this would be the salivary glands. We'll talk more about the salivary glands um, producing saliva, and then they have the ducts that run into your mouth so that the saliva um, is transported directly to um, the, the place where it is needed, right? And salivary glands have enzymes in them, so it makes sense that they wouldn't be um, directly transported into um, the blood, which is the other type of gland. So we have endocrine glands. This secretes hormones. Into the circulatory system. So rather than having ducts, the hormones are just in your blood and they are transported throughout the entire body but they will only bind, the hormones will only bind to the cells that have receptors for them. So hormones bind to receptors on the surface of the cells. Okay. So, for example, we have um, many um, hormones produced by the pituitary gland. Okay, so this would be an example, the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland, one thing that the pituitary gland produces is growth hormone. And this is actually a protein, but it um, targets growing bones. So as the, in children, as the bones lengthen, it is in response to the presence of growth hormone in the blood that specifically targets the bones. Now that growth hormone goes everywhere that the circulatory system does, but it only binds to the receptors on the bones, allowing them to grow. Okay. It's interesting because growth hormone tends to um, be released um, at, at greater levels at night, right? And also, interestingly, in the spring. So children tend to grow, but it's not, you know, they tend to grow at night, right? And then they also tend to grow faster in the spring um, than in other times of the year. Okay. So if we look at um, the other epithelial tissues besides the glands, so we can talk about naming epithelial tissues. Okay. 
the first thing that we can do is we can talk about the shape of the cell. So if the cell is flat, it is said to be squamous. So this means flat. If it is square and it's a cube, it's called cuboidal, right, cube-shaped. And it can also be columnar. Oops, is there only one L? I think there's only one L in there. Columnar. So that's column-shaped. We can also talk about the layers of cells. So if it is a single layer of cells, it is said to be simple. If it is uh, multiple layers, it is said to be stratified. And if it looks layered, but it's not, it is said to be pseudo-stratified. So for example, the lining of your trachea looks like it's layered, but really it is only a single layer, so it is pseudo-stratified. It's falsely layered, right? So it just looks like it. And it looks like it because the nuclei are actually at different levels in the cells, and so it's a little bit confusing when you look at it. So we're going to look at some of these examples in lab tomorrow. So um, we can also talk about if it is ciliated. Okay. So yes or no. So for example, your epidermis is simple squamous epithelial tissue. So that means that it is a single layer of flat cells. Actually, sorry, not set, you're not your upper dome, sorry, it's stratified, right stratified, sorry. Uh, simple would be a single layer, and that would be like found in the lungs or in your capillaries. So it is stratified squamous. So it's many layers of flat cells, and we actually slough them off, right? So the epidermis is just that outermost layer of skin that we're constantly sloughing off into the environment, and it's constantly being replaced by living cells that are reproducing. So the, the, they're kind of dead cells when we get to the outer epidermis, it's a layer of dead cells. Okay, okay. so we'll talk about, when we go through the different organs and the organ systems, we'll talk about the different um, types of epithelial tissue that is associated with each of those. Okay, so this is an example. What type of shape of the cell do you think this is? Oh, it says right here, column-shaped, right? So this is ciliated columnar epithelial tissue. And then this is my goblet cell. And so this would be the type of tissue that is like found lining your small intestine. They have cilia because that increases the surface area over which absorption takes place. And so there's a huge surface area in the small intestine and absorption takes place and the nutrients get taken up by these cells and then it gets passed, most of the nutrients get passed to the blood vessels that then transport um, the, um, the blood out to, or the nutrients out to the body, okay? Okay, so we also have connective tissue. So we, four different types of tissue. So this is connective tissue. This is another type. So this would be my second type of tissue. So connective tissue is very diverse, and it is characterized by cells within a matrix. So if we look at connective tissue, it includes bones, it includes cartilage, fat, 
Um, it includes um, uh, blood, tendons, okay, for example. And so if we look at this example of the, of a, um, and this is from your book, this just shows a cell and the matrix is composed of protein. So for example, in our bones, we have connected tissue and bones are living tissue and they have cells that lay down the matrix. And so the matrix can have fibers in it that give it its strength. So for example, bone and cartilage have collagen fibers that make it very strong, okay? So the matrix can contain fibers. Blood, for example, doesn't contain fibers, but the matrix of the blood is the blood plasma, okay? So it can contain fibers. For example, bone um, has collagen fibers. And collagen is a type of structural protein. So bone um, is strong not only because it's mineralized, it has calcium in it, for example, um, but it also is strong because it has collagen. And you can do a, a nifty little experiment with chicken bones where you can put them in vinegar, and if you keep replacing the vinegar um, every few days after a couple weeks, you'll have all you'll have dissolved all the salts, and what you are left is with the collagen. And so you'll like have a chicken bone that would normally break if you bent it in two, but the chicken bone that has had all of its minerals taken out will actually bend. It'll be like rubbery bone, right? And that is the collagen fibers, those structural proteins. So it's the protein that gives it that bone the strength of like twisting and and compression and all kinds of other things okay so that's connective tissue the third type of tissue will include muscular tissue and there are three types so for example we have what is called smooth muscle and this is involuntary, and it lacks striations, hence it is called smooth. Involuntary meaning that I can't consciously cause my stomach to contract, for example. So when we look at where the smooth muscle is, it's in the digestive organs. So in the digestive tract specifically, so like my esophagus and my stomach and my intestines are constantly contracting to move the food through. It's a type of contraction called peristalsis, right? And that is involuntary control. It's also found in our blood vessels. So your blood vessel can contract or constrict and blood will be shunted to a different area and so that contraction and relaxation of that smooth muscle is really important to allow blood to go to different parts of the body okay we also have cardiac muscle this tends to be involuntary although with biofeedback you know you can um, slow down your breath and you can relax yourself and you can lower your heart rate right? Um, but it is involuntary. That's actually a good thing because we won't want to have to think constantly about causing our heart to contract, right? This has striations. And the cells are branched. This is obviously found in the heart. So this is your heart muscle. And the really cool thing about heart muscle is, is that individual cells will contract on their own without nervous stimuli. So cells can contract without nervous stimuli.
And so you can have an individual cell in a Petri dish and it will contract. And then you get two cells together and if they're contracting asynchronously and they touch, they will start to contract together. So we're gonna talk about the structure of the heart and how what that pacemaker is that helps to get all of these cells to contract together synchronously to allow the heart to, to allow the heart to move the blood up and out and into the body. Um, the last one is skeletal muscle. So when you think about movement and locomotion, this is voluntary, meaning that we can consciously cause a muscle to contract. And these are also striated, so they have striations. And the other important thing about the skeletal muscles is, is that they are large and they are multinucleated. Which means that they have many different or many nuclei within one cell. Skeletal muscle, when it develops, when you develop, it's actually caused by the fusion of, of stem cells to, to produce long cells. So if you think about the cells like in your biceps muscle, or even if you, in some of your longer muscles, these are pretty long cells, right? And when they contract, they um, can attach to the bones and allow the bone, um, bones to move at the joint, right? So this would be like your biceps muscle, would be skeletal muscle. Okay, so here in your book, you can see the smooth muscle, single nuclei. You can see striated skeletal muscles. The nuclei are on the edges, and we're gonna talk about what these striations are, right? The um, cardiac muscles, um, doesn't show it really well here, but they're branched, and then they have little connections between them, because if you think about the heart, it doesn't have any hard uh, structure to contract against, so it actually contracts against itself to cause the movement of the heart. So the last type of tissue is called nervous tissue. And it is composed of neurons, which are specialized cells that produce neurotransmitters. And we're going to look at the structure of the neuron in detail. This is a neuron. Neurons also can be very long. So, for example, when your sciatic nerve, the cell body with the nucleus is actually up in the spinal cord. And then this nerve comes down along the back of your leg and all the way to your toes. And that um, would consist, the nerve would consist of bundles of these um, extensions called axons. So many, many axons bundled together make up a nerve. Okay. The other tissue, the other cells here, which is actually really important, um, are called glial cells. So glial cells are specifically associated with nervous tissue, and these are helper cells. So they, um, um, since the neurons are so specialized, these are what actually maintain the environment. They kind of clean up the environment and they help to maintain the environment. And so when you actually look at nervous tissue, you have about 10 glial cells for every one neuron. Right? So the neurons are large, but the glial cells outnumber them. Right. And so we're going to talk about some glial cells, some that you might have already heard, like Schwann cells are examples of glial cells. If you look at your diagram here, um, oligodendrocyte, that would be a, a glial cell. An astrocyte would be a glial cell. And then we have this um, cell, which is actually the neuron. right? And it receives neurotransmitters. It can bind neurotransmitters at this end and it can produce neurotransmitters at this end, okay? So those are the four different types of tissues that you have in your body. And we're gonna talk about um, them in relationship to the different organs and the different systems.
Okay, so homeostasis. Um, this literally means homeo means same state. But recently we have discovered that um, rather than uh, being exactly the same state all the time, a better definition for homeostasis is a dynamic equilibrium. So this would be the new way of viewing homeostasis. Okay, so when you look at this, equilibrium means it's a, it's a, a relatively um, stable set point, but the body can fluctuate depending upon the uh, environment. So the way to um, define this is, is that the body can respond to the environment. and maintain a relatively stable set point. Okay. So I'm gonna show you a short little video that talks about this idea. It's like a five minute video. this is set up. So the example here is going to be heart rate, and it's going to be resting heart rate over a long period of time. So over minutes or hours. Brian Goodwin sent me to see Eric Goldberger, a cardiologist at Harvard, with some very surprising ideas about health. It appears that health represents a remarkable balance between excessive order on the one hand, things being overstructured, and complete randomness on the other, where there's, in essence, there would be physiologic anarchy. And the healthy systems like to be there. They don't sit still. They're always kind of fidgeting. They're always ready for everything. When people listen to a healthy heart, what they hear is something that sounds quite regular. It's, it's either the love dub, love dub, where they are looking at a cardiac monitor that's showing something that's, that seems to be ticking off impulses, much like a clock. But in fact, when you look at the way the heartbeat is actually changing in a very subtle way, what you see is this extraordinarily complex variability. It was to us a, an amazing surprise to see that the, the resting heartbeat uh, was in fact as complicated as anything that we were able to find uh, elsewhere in nature. If you measure the beat over many hours, 
you discover that the heart's rhythm is constantly changing. Well, I'd like to show you a little game. Uh, it's a physiologic game that, that, that we developed in the laboratory. And what we're going to see is the pattern that your heartbeat makes if you're just basically sitting around. This is just a resting heart. Yeah, the is that a surprise part. to you? Uh, it is. Yeah, this tracing here is very different from what you might suppose if you completely came from the tradition of homeostasis. This should be, if you're resting and you're quiet, uh, this should be a straight line or something approaching exactly. that. So one of the ways of trying to convey what healthy physiology is all about is to take this sequence and to translate it, to transpose it or to map it uh, into a sequence of notes. And so the question is, what does your heart sound like? What What is the music of the healthy heart? So that was wonderful. That's a normal heart. That's a normal heart. And what we're going to see here now is, is a very different pattern. This is the heartbeat uh, tracing from the patient with heart failure. And what you see here is actually quite different from mm -hmm. the healthy. Now, things actually look uh, more organized. They look, uh, in a sense, uh, more periodic. And so let's play it out and see what this sounds like. <laughs> Would you prefer to listen to the, the healthy heart or, or this? Boy, what a contrast. So very repetitious, very monotonous. And the sicker and sicker people get, the, the more the variability collapses. And ultimately, you may end up with just one note repeating itself. So in the sickest pathologies, you can literally go from this very musical, tuneful dance, which is the healthy heartbeat, what becomes a, a one note marching band. The essence of, of healthy functions is adaptability, the ability to cope with an environment that's going to play tricks on you if you don't know what's going to happen next. So having this sort of bubbly type of turbulent like dynamic, which has all these different frequencies, all these different responses built in gives you an advantage. So as long as you're playing a symphony in your chest, everything's fine. The, the old story about a song in your heart, but literally that is in fact the case. Okay, so that's the idea of dynamic equilibrium. Any questions about that? No. So we're going to do um, some experiments where you're going to like hold on to heart rate monitors, right? And you're like, well, why is it all like all over the place? Does that mean that I'm sick? And I'm like, no, that means that you're like able to respond, right? And so even just like thinking about things can cause your heart rate to, to spike, right? OK. So let's talk about the mechanism of homeostasis. So when we look at mechanism, it is the negative feedback mechanism that maintains homeostatic balances. And if we look at the components of this negative feedback mechanism, we can have a stimulus. And the stimulus could be internal or external. So oftentimes we make the mistake of assuming that all the stimuli that we're responding to are external. But if you think about like glucose levels, calcium levels, blood pH, all of that would be internal. And so we have to have receptors that would are able to detect the stimulus. Right. So, for example, we have chemoreceptors right, that are able to detect levels of, of chemicals in our blood, right? So they could detect levels 
of glucose in the blood, for example. So this is just an example of an internal chemoreceptor. They could also detect blood pH, they could detect calcium levels, all kinds of things, okay? Then the receptors send a signal to the control center, and that could be the brain, or it could be a gland, it could be an organ, right? So it could be like the pancreas gland, it could be a kidney, it could be the brain, whatever the control center is, okay? So that would be what is going to respond to the stimulus. And the signal is sent um, via what is called an afferent pathway. So A means that's the beginning, the, the next one's gonna be efferent. So just, I always remember A, it's the first part of the cycle. E is the second part of the cycle. Okay. Okay. So the control center responds by sending a signal out to the effectors via the efferent pathway. This control center is going to respond to changes in the set point, right? So it um, regulates the set point. And this will be important when we talk about body temperature, because sometimes um, when we get a fever, our set point will actually change, like it'll get higher, and our body temperature will go up. So the control center regulates the set point. The effectors respond by decreasing the stimulus. This is uh, efferent, efferent, yeah. By decreasing the stimulus. Hence, it is negative, right? Negative feedback is just the mechanism that causes a response that decreases the initial stimuli. Okay. So in your book, the example they gave in your book is thermoregulation. So the response could be an internal, uh, they're regulating the blood uh, temperature so you could have a stimuli that your blood temperature is too high that sends a signal those receptors respond by sending a signal to the control center which in this case is the brain and then the response would be that you would sweat and so the effectors would be the sweat glands and then the same thing would happen with um, if you are too cold but then in response we would shiver and by shivering we actually generate heat during shivering, and so that would help to raise the body temperature back up. So this is the example, and so you wanna look at that example in your textbook, okay, of thermoregulation, and there's an image here. So you wanna study this image, okay? If your body temperature is too high, right, blood vessels will dilate. That means that blood is gonna get shunt to the surface of your skin, and then you're gonna to start to sweat and heat is lost from the body as the sweat evaporates off the surface of the body. And so notice how this decreases the initial stimuli because heat is lost to the environment, okay? And then this would be the shivering, um, it generating heat. So this is different than a positive feedback. When we look at positive feedback mechanisms, they do not maintain homeostasis. Okay, so they do not function. 
to maintain homeostasis. So the example um, that they give is an example where there is an end to the process. And so this would be like labor. Okay, so an example, or parturition, giving birth. And so in this particular instance, the baby pushes against the cervix. The response is more oxytocin is released. And this increases the strength of the contractions. Okay, so that's going to increase baby pushing, right? So that's a positive feedback because the response of increasing the strength of the contraction is actually going to increase the stimulus. And then ultimately, the baby's head pushes through the cervix, right? And the baby is propelled out um, through the birth canal by the contractions that are occurring in the uterus. The, the smooth muscle contractions in the uterus. So this is the example of positive feedback because the response increases the stimulus. Okay. These are rare occurrences. Another example that is sometimes given is uh, blood clotting tends to um, have a positive feedback because the more the blood clots, the more uh, clotting factor is produced, so the, it is kind of a positive feedback until the blood stops flowing out of the wound. Okay. Any questions about that idea? So we're going to talk about homeostatic imbalances as we go through the different systems. Okay, so we're going to take a break, and I'm going to give you um, a topic and um, so we're going to just leave our stuff here, but you need something to write with. And we're going to move next door to the computer lab. And you want to find everybody needs their own computer. And they, hopefully there's enough on and ready to go.
Did I give you one? Okay, did everybody get a, um, a picture of the digestive system? Okay. So we're going to start on the digestive system today, and then a lot of what you're going to be looking at tomorrow in terms of rat anatomy is going to be the digestive system as well. So when we talk about digestion, um, one thing to point out is, is that digestion can be with inside the cell. So this is inside the cell the cell and extra means outside the cell so for example when we were talking about the sponges they do not have a digestive tract and so all of their digestion has to be intracellular okay so anytime we have extracellular digestion that goes along with having a gastrovascular cavity so here we have a gastrovascular cavity, right? And this is where enzymes are released into a space. Where digestion takes place. Another thing that we can talk about is um, mechanical versus chemical digestion. So when we have mechanical digestion, this is breaking a substance down into smaller pieces over which that increase in surface area over which the enzymes can actually work. And so this is breaking the food down into smaller pieces. Okay, so for example, we do this through chewing, but we're also going to talk about how bile is a chemical that actually mechanically digests fats. So those would be two examples of mechanical digestion, breaking the food down by chewing it, and then bile actually um, is released into the small intestine and it breaks down the fats into smaller fat droplets, okay? So chemical digestion is through the use of enzymes. And so enzymes are proteins that um, bind to molecules and break chemical bonds. Okay. 
So when we look at enzymes, generally, um, if you look at an enzyme like lactase, the ACE ending means that it is an enzyme. So enzymes typically have ACE as an ending. So lactase breaks down milk sugar, which is lactose, right? So lactose is broken down in the presence of lactase into glucose and galactose. So this is milk sugar. Some people who are lactose intolerant do not have this enzyme. So if they do not have that enzyme, then they cannot digest the lactose, and what digests it is the microorganisms in the digestive tract, and that produces excess gas. And so generally people that are lactose intolerant, if they eat ice cream or if they eat yogurt or milk products, then they tend to have gas and painful bloating, and then they can also have diarrhea associated with it, okay? So lactase is the enzyme that breaks down lactose. So that's an example of chemical digestion. Okay, so if we look at the different digestive systems that we've already talked about, this is um, a digestive tract where we have only one opening, right? And so this would be the hydra. And remember that the hydra had extracellular digestion, so it releases enzymes into the space to break down its food. And the um, jellyfish or the medusa would also have that. But when we look at complete digestive systems, the advantage is that the food is traveling in one direction through the digestive system. So you have compartmentalization so different parts of the digestive system can have different functions, okay? So there's an advantage to a complete digestive tract. And that is you have compartmentalization or you have compartments where different things occur. So for example, in the stomach, it's super acidic, really low pH. And um, then when it goes into the small intestine, the pH actually um, has to be raised back to normal levels for the enzymes um, that come in from the pancreas to do their work. So when we have compartmentalization, that means that we can have part of it being the stomach where um, we have um, a, a high um, acid content. So let's look at the human digestive system. So we can start in the mouth. So we are mammals, and as mammals, we have what is called heterodont dentition. You can do it if you want, but you're going to have lots of, so you might not want to. I mean, you could write it if you wanted to, label them out. Okay. This is sometimes also called the oral cavity, right? Okay. Heterodont dentition. This is versus homodont. So what do you think that means, heterodont? We have different types of teeth, right? And so if you think about it, we have uh, incisors that would clip, like if you're eating a carrot. We also have, if you're eating a piece of beef jerky, you wouldn't want to use your incisors because they just wouldn't work, right? So you use your canines to rip the beef jerky. And then if you want to grind stuff really, really well, you use your molars, okay? So the advantage of heterodont dentition is, is this, this increases mechanical digest, digestion, and this increases the efficiency of the digestion, right? So if you think about um, in that video that we watched with the um, garter snakes, 
when they uh, had the garter snake regurgitate the newt, did it look like the newt had been chewed? No, no right? And so when, when um, snakes swallow their prey whole, they just use their teeth to kind of hold the prey in their mouth. Mouth. They do not chew it, right? And it takes a lot longer for a snake to digest its meal than it would for a mammal to digest its meal, okay? So this is actually related to endothermy and the idea that we need to be really efficient at our digestion in order to use it as energy to maintain our body temperature. So when we were looking at the fish, they had homodont dentition. Fish do not chew their food. Heterodont dentition means that we have different types of teeth which are really efficient at chewing the food. Okay. We also have the tongue, and the tongue has sensory receptors on it. Now, fine sense of taste generally is related to smell like you know, being able to tell garlic or wine or, or uh, chocolate, the smell of chocolate. So when we look at our tongue, it's really simple senses, and there's actually five different types. So for example, we have salty, salt, right? We have sweet, we have sour, we have bitter, and does anybody know the last one? You mommy. So if we look at these from an evolutionary perspective at a time when we did not have like grocery stores or you didn't have food labels and you had to try to figure out what was in the food and what was it good for, right? So salty, right, means that it has sodium and chloride in it. These are essential ions that we need to survive. So we need levels of sodium and chloride in our blood and in our nervous tissue so that our nervous system works properly. So you can crave salty if those levels are too low. And so like when you work out, sometimes you're craving like Gatorade. Gatorade has electrolytes in it. So essentially Gatorade is, is a sugar water with salt added. Okay, it has magnesium in it too and some other things, okay? So sweet is energy. So if you don't eat for long periods of time, you're going to crave sweet, right? Because you're going to be low and running low on energy. What do you think sour is, a, is a, our ability to detect sour is? No. Bitter is. So we'll put that down. So bitter is toxins. Okay. What's sour? Acidity. But what is the vitamin that we need? C, right? So vitamin C, okay, that's an essential vitamin that we need in our diet. We get scurvy, right? Pirates got scurvy because they didn't have access to fruits that had vitamin C in it. And what is umami? Um, it is actually protein. So it is said to be savory, umami. So there are, it's kind of funny when we look at our food, they try to trick us, right, to think that there's something in it that's not. So a really good example of that is MSG, right? So MSG is an additive to foods, um, including Doritos, right? So this is called monosodium glutamate. So this is kind of an aside. This is not monosodium glutamate. And it's a food additive. And it is savory. Right? So if you're eating Doritos chips, your body is tricked into thinking that you're actually getting protein when there is no protein in there. Right? So there's salty, then there's um, lots of carbohydrates, but there's very little protein in, in uh, Doritos, but they have MSG. So MSG just kind of tricks your body into thinking that there's something there that's not. So the tongue is also really important in manipulating the food 
So I'll put manipulates food. And specifically, it allows us to swallow the food as a bolus. Okay, so we do not tend to, tend to inhale our food, right? So when we swallow, we kind of manipulate it with the tongue, it forms a ball, and then we swallow it. Does anybody know why it's important to swallow food as a ball of food rather than just little pieces? Hmm? Yes, it helps what? Pushes down on what? Keeps it from going into your trachea? Yes. So the bolus depresses the epiglottis. And the epiglottis is a little flap that keeps the food from going into the trachea. So it prevents food from going into the trachea. So it gets funneled to the esophagus, which is behind your trachea. So if you in inhale food, sometimes it goes in the wrong pipe, right, and they end up coughing. Okay. So we also have salivary glands. Now, do you think, sa or actually I already mentioned the salivary glands, what type of gland are they? Endocrine or exocrine? Exocrine. The salivary glands have obviously water, but there's also enzymes, and there's also antibodies. Antibodies are part of the immune system, right? So that if we have bacteria in our mouth, those antibodies will help to, to attack those back, bad bacteria and destroy them. And the enzyme that we have um, in our mouth is called salivary amylase. And this specifically, notice the ACE ending, notice salivary. We also have pancreatic amylase. This specifically digests starch. So amyl means starch, okay? So this would be starch. And starch is a polysaccharide of glucose. And it is broken down into um, maltose. So if you've ever eaten a potato raw, you know that starch is not sweet, right? It has to be broken down, and when you cook the potato, then the potato gets sweeter, right? And it actually, the starch actually goes into solution, so it's not so grainy if you've ever eaten raw potatoes. And um, <clears throat> then it converts it into this, right? Also, when we eat stuff, like say you're eating a cracker, the longer you hold it in your mouth, the sweeter it is gonna taste. So you might initially put it in your mouth and it doesn't taste very sweet, and then the enzyme is gonna to start to work and it'll taste sweeter and sweeter. And you could also chew versus not chew, and chewing would increase the action of this enzyme, so it'll become sweeter faster if you chew it, okay? So that's the salivary amylase, that's the enzyme um, that has chemical digestion in the oral cavity, and the teeth would be the mechanical digestion in the oral cavity. Okay. So I'm going to stop there for today. And on Monday, we're going to continue with our discussion of digestion. And um, then on Wednesday, you're going to have a quiz. So you're going to have a quiz over this information plus what we go over on Monday.